Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for what you have done in our lives, what your grace has accomplished, what your power has done, what peace we have experienced as a result of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we are asking that as we come today to rejoice together and to see what that grace and power did in an individual in days of old. We pray that you help us to appreciate what you've done for us more and more in Jesus' name. Amen. And as you have picked up this instrument we're going to study as a mighty tool in your hand, and as we appreciate what you are able to do in such an individual, Father, we are asking that what you intend to do in every one of us and with every one of us will be accomplished in Jesus' name. Amen. As he yielded in your hand, like clay in the hands of the potter, teach us to yield. Amen. Teach us to surrender. Amen. So that what you have intended concerning every one of us will be accomplished. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, we have already encountered an individual that had a face-to-face -face experience with the Lord Jesus Christ between Jerusalem and Damascus. He was the worst of all sinners by his own confession, and he became the greatest of all saints by the grace of God. On him, the Lord himself demonstrated his love and kindness and power, in that he took up this man, and in no time at all, in an instantaneous moment of time, the Lord changed his life and transformed him. And a type of transformation and change came over his life that, if it wasn't for the records of the Bible and the testimonies of the whole of church history, and the observations of people that were even outside the church that lived in his own time that has written that have written about him one is likely to almost be wondering how such a change could happen to anybody but then we believe in god we know with him all things are possible and we know the power of an encounter with the lord jesus christ and we just see one of the evidences here as we are brought face to face with saul of tarsus that became an apostle both to the Gentiles and to the others that lived in his own time. Two times in Acts of the Apostles, he gave the testimony himself as to what happened to him. And in various parts of the epistles, he wrote of the grace of God that had been showed unto him and of the power, the transformation and the change that took place in his heart and life after that encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ on the way to Damascus. And as we study his own life, as we study the transformation and the change, it makes us to appreciate the love of God and the power of God and also makes us to understand that in our own lives too, what God has intended to do, he will do without anybody that can hinder him. And as we come to the scripture this evening, this is what we must have in our mind. Already, Paul the Apostle has served his own generation. This is our own time to serve our own generation. What God did through him, God can do through us. By his own testimony and confession, he said, I am what I am only by the grace of God. And in that, he's telling us, you can be what you ought to be by that same grace of God. Let me read the account to you in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, from verse 10 now. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the street which is called Strange and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayed. And I seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard 
by many of this man. How much evil he has done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority to the, from the chief priest to bind all that call upon thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. To bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. I want you to realize as you come before the Lord and you study the word of God that even though you have not seen a vision, you have not heard a voice, you are a chosen vessel. Not because of a great talent you have, but because of God's own purpose. Not because of how great much uh, you have done, no, but because of his own design. Not because you are so great and you are so good in your own self, but because of the decision of Almighty God in the court of heaven, you are a chosen vessel. And there have been other people that have been chosen vessels before you. You want to see how eventually they got into the ministry, how eventually the Lord used them, how eventually they realized it and they knew it, and how they operated in the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish the task that God had for them. But something you must not forget as we go on is that you are a chosen vessel already. And uh, in the hand of God, you can never tell how much the Lord can accomplish through you. Now listen to me. A pen is um, perhaps not worth of anything in terms of money. You might call it just a simple pen. And almost anybody can afford it. But you understand that it depends on who is handling the pen. Because if a primary school child will handle that pen, there is not much that the primary school child will be able to do. But if that same fountain pen will get into the hand of a professor at the university, still the same pen, the same ink, the same color, but you can never tell what the professor can write with that pen. But if that same pen will get into the hand of the president of a whole uh, country, nation, you cannot tell what can be written by that same pen. Because that same pen can write something that will determine the destiny. That will determine what will happen to a whole nation. And that same pen can just sign a signature in the hand of that president. And there is no uh, amount of... Uh, opposition from any other person any other group of people that can change what that small pen can write well there is a president in heaven it's not a president of just a single country it's a president of the whole universe heaven and earth and you are the pen in his hand you are not more than as you are sitting down small your brain is you know just like the little ink in that fountain pen but in the hand of the president in heaven and on earth in the hand of the great ruler, the omnipotent one, the sovereign one, the great king of kings and the lord of laws, you cannot tell what the heavenly father, the heavenly God, the heavenly king can write with the pen in his hand. You are a chosen vessel. And when God decides that he'll pick you up, it might be a little biro, a little pencil, a little fountain pen. If God is picking up your life, something ahead of you is very, very great. Because that's the wonder of grace. And it happened to this man Saul. He was uh, going with, you know, a purpose in his own heart to destroy the people of God in Damascus. But then he had an encounter. You already know the story that Jesus Christ met him by the way. And even though the people that were joining with Saul did not actually see the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ they heard the sound of his voice and then Saul heard Saul Saul why persecutest thou me you will think that after that after that sentence the Lord in his power in his glory will command legions of angels and say catch him 
crush him, destroy his life. He has done so much against me. Oh no, when Jesus appears to you, he is not appearing to you to condemn you, to crush you, to condemn you, and to kill you, to destroy. He comes always with grace. Have you ever met the Lord? And it doesn't matter where you're meeting the Lord. It doesn't even matter what words are coming out of his mouth. He may be saying, why have you persecuted me? Even when he's saying that, he's coming with grace. He's coming with love. Why have you committed so much sin? Even when Jesus is telling you that, he's coming with grace and love. Why have you rebelled against me all that, all this time since you were born? Even when the Lord is saying something very serious and very stern, he's coming with grace and love. And Saul said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And Jesus answered, I'm sorry you've gone, too, you've gone too far. I cannot have you to do anything in my kingdom. You are a bloody man. Your hands are full of blood. Your heart is full of guilt. Your heart is full of condemnation. You have gone so far. I am sorry grace cannot redeem you because uh, you have done too much. No. The grace of God is deeper than your sin, greater than your sin, and it's broader than the scope of your skin, of your sin. No matter how much you have done against the kingdom, against the Lord, against the king himself, grace is still available for you. And Jesus said, you know what, Saul? All you have ever done against me will forget everything right now. Come on my side. You are on the Lord's side from now on. And I will direct your life from now on. I will be from, with you from now on. And you will not even need to waste any time at all. You get into the city Damascus and it shall be told thee what thou must do. All your sins you have committed by an agreement between me and you. We can put everything behind and we can put everything beneath the sea of God's forgetfulness. Never to be remembered anymore. Not by God, not by the Holy Ghost, not by myself, not by angels, not even by even the church. When you have cleansed off everything and you are going to become a great person in the hand of the Lord. And with that, um, Saul went to Damascus. When he got to Damascus, apparently he must have known somebody in Damascus called the Judas. Not Judas Iscariot, that one has died. Living by the street that is called Strange. Damascus was a very big city. And there was a street that went from one corner of the, of the city right through to the other. And it was very straight. And they just called it by, they described it by how good the street was. It was very straight, so they just called uh, that street a uh, street. And the house of Judas was just right there, by the street straight. And he lodged there. And uh, apparently the people in Damascus, they knew that Saul was coming. But what happened on the way, they did not know. And that man, he began to pray. And in what follows, I want to show you six characteristics of new life in Saul. Has he been born again? Has a change happened unto him? Has he been transformed? As the Almighty behave like the Almighty again to change him, because you know, every time that a sinner is changed to a saint, every time that the worst of sinners is changed to the best of saints, every time that a cruel servant of Satan is changed to become a loyal servant of the Savior, you know that the Lord is manifesting his power and his might and his majesty and his glory, and God has done it again. Let's see. The characteristics in his life. Already on the road, he has manifested something that you call faith in the Savior. He believed already. He did not doubt. He said, Lord, what will you have me to do? You call that surrender and consecration. He yielded everything to the Lord. And when the Lord said, you go into the city, you obeyed immediately. Obviously, he had faith in the Savior. Now he entered Damascus. You know what? There was nothing in his heart that wanted to see the blood of the saints. 
that wanted to see the saints stoned, that wanted to see the men and the women that were calling on the name of the Lord imprisoned. You know then he must have been converted. What is conversion? A change of life. Did he have age? Oh yes, he had age. When did he have age? When he met the Lord on the way. Because by the time he entered into Damascus, a change had happened already. When he left Jerusalem, there was hatred and bitterness in his heart against Jesus and against the disciples. When he entered Damascus, there was love and appreciation in his heart. Has he been changed? Oh yes, he was converted before he ever entered Damascus. Now there was um, a letter in his hand that he had got from the authorities when he left Jerusalem. Now by the time he entered Damascus, he believed in no other authority except the authority of Jesus Christ. Had he been changed? Oh yes, he had been changed. A transformation had taken place. You call it conversion. By the time he got out of um, Jerusalem, his closest friends were the chief priests in the synagogue. By the time he entered into um, Damascus, he didn't go to any of those chief priests. His friends had now changed. He now was just in the house of one that is called Judas. And he had begun to pray unto the Lord. Has he been converted? Oh yes, a conversion had happened. Before he left Jerusalem, he would only pray to Almighty God and he never mentioned the name Jesus with his mouth. He hated that name. He hated everything connected with that name. You know what? He had now gone into Damascus and he was in the house of one called Judas. You know what he was doing? He was praying to the Lord in the name of Jesus. And you know what? He had been converted. Before he left um, Jerusalem, prayer was not his lifestyle. What was his lifestyle? Just moving about from one place to the other and being actively engaged in the persecution of the saints. He was not a person that could be patient and be kneeling down somewhere, sitting down somewhere. He was always an active man and he was active going from house to house. He entered Damascus and we're told he was only in one house. What was he doing? He wasn't going about from house to house anymore and getting people into the prison. He was just saying, oh Lord, here am I. What will you have me to do? And immediately you can see right now that he had been changed. Conversion had taken place. Before he left Jerusalem, he had never heard the voice of the Lord. He had never seen a vision. Now he was in Damascus and the Lord was telling Ananias, already Saul is praying, already he has seen a vision of Ananias coming to him. Ananias, he is expecting you. What is that? Conversion? I'm telling you that it doesn't take time. Transformation, when it is done by God, it is in a moment of time, it is instantaneous. Conversion is not a process. Conversion is an instantaneous work of grace. The moment you meet the Lord, the moment you surrender to the Lord, the moment you say, oh Lord, here am I, just as I am, I come, I come. At that moment of time, instantaneously, there is something that is called the work of grace. It is called redemption or justification by faith, the salvation of your soul. It happens in a moment of time and your life is changed. Listen to the Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit and in verse 15 for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry Abba Father it happened to him in a second Corinthians chapter 5 Verse 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. My brother, my sister, you ask yourself a question. The moment uh, Paul, a uh, Saul of Tarsus, met Jesus Christ on the way, and he entered into, into Damascus, was he going into the house to pray for salvation when he entered into Damascus? Wasn't he a new creature already? Hatred gone? Bitterness gone? Desire to see the blood of the saints, everything is gone from him. Any affiliation with the chief priest before he even entered Damascus, all the affiliation with the chief priest had gone away from his heart. And the desire to persecute the children of God, everything had gone away. And the desire to be a great man in Judaism, everything had gone away. The desire to continue in religion, in the religion of the Jews, everything had gone away. The desire to keep intimacy, close relationship with the chief priest, everything had gone away. And the desire to love 
love the Lord and the desire to just love the saints, the desire for fellowship was all in his life. Was he not a new creature? Of course he was. And you cannot be except you are born again. He was born again. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Were they passed away? <laughs> you as the people that followed him from Jerusalem to Damascus. From that time that everybody fell down and they rose up and he couldn't see anybody and he became blind from that point near Damascus until they entered Damascus and they were saying so rabbi can you see anything oh no I can't see anything who has made you blind like this this is not time for talking I have seen something they didn't hear him cursing God cursing Jesus Christ you know he was a blasphemer before and he abused that name of Jesus before they didn't hear him cursing the name of Jesus from that time he was, he was made blind and he entered into Damascus old things have passed away the blasphemy everything was gone the abusive language everything was gone the evil in his heart everything was gone he was a new creature and behold all things have become new so eat something I have a meat to eat you know not all so uh, the rabbis they knew that you came to town can you give them attention they want to know what's your purpose for coming to the town no i have uh, no purpose of them anymore i'm in communion with god all things are passed away all things have become new will you want to just say hello to the chief priest oh no we are not in the same gang anymore leave me alone my own people new people they'll be coming to visit me the Lord has shown me in a vision already. You ask the people that they journeyed together. When they got into Damascus, they were discussing one with the other. What is this that has happened to him? Because he didn't have time yet to tell a testimony. He was just in deep uh, devotion and uh, commitment and worship and prayer and fellowship with the Lord. All things have passed away. All things have become new. In First Timothy, I'm reading chapter 1. Verse 12, I thank Jesus Christ. Now listen to me. A person that didn't want to mention that name before because he, hate, he said, I hated this way. I hated it. And I did everything imaginable to stamp out that name. But you know, in every one of his epistles, at the very beginning of every epistle, he'll mention Jesus Christ. And whenever you preach in any synagogue, he'll mention Jesus Christ right from the beginning. And you know, he had known the Old Testament. Immediately, he came out of uh, the three days of blindness and the three days of just waiting upon the Lord. He began convincing everybody that this Jesus is the very Son of God. What had made that change? Conversion, a transformation. It happened to him. I thank Jesus Christ, our Lord who has enabled me for that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry and he said you want to understand this i was before a blasphemer a persecutor and injurious but i obtained mercy my brother my sister when did he obtain mercy at the end of the three days he was praying no sir when he entered into damascus and entered into the house of judas no sir at the time he met jesus christ on the way and he said who are you lord and the Lord said, I am Jesus. Immediately, he believed that Jesus rose from the dead. Immediately, because a dead man will not talk. And Paul began right on the way there saying, ah, Was that not Jesus Christ that I said? It's incredible for me to believe that a Jesus rose from the dead. That it's all a lie. And he covered the whole of Jerusalem with the lie. That Jesus is risen from the dead. Who am I hearing talking? I hear him saying, I am Jesus. I am Jesus. Whom you persecute. Oh Lord, if that is you talking, I believe resurrection. That is it. I believe you are the son of God. I believe you are the way to God. I believe you are the prince of life. I believe you are alive forevermore. And I believe that all that I've done, I did it in ignorance. And right there, just in a moment of time, taking off an eye, he obtained mercy right there. And he said, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Then he said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And should in case you say, well, I have gone too far. He said, listen to me. I am the chief of all sinners. But now he has given me that salvation and he will save you. 
Because if he can save the head of the gang, if he can save the chief of the sinners, if he can save the number one critic and the number one blasphemer, he will save the rest also. How be it for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life. He was saved. He was saved. And you know, we rejoice. We rejoice because we know this. If he could save Saul, he will save anybody else. Anybody else. And as you are here today, and you know the big sins you have committed if you are a sinner. And you are thinking, well, I've committed so great sins. Abortion. I've robbed. I've done evil. I've told lies. I've used juju medicine against people. Listen to me. Saul was the chief of all sinners. The greatest. The head of the gang. And the head of the gang became saved. Anyone can be saved. No matter what we have done before. The moment we just surrender to the Lord and we say, oh Lord, here am I. I want to be saved. I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I turn around. I turn away from all my evil. That moment, you are a candidate of the kingdom of God. And you know, we come back to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9. His life was turned around. He became saved. And I just want, to, I want you to see six characteristics in his life. After he, he gave his life to the Lord. After he became converted and transformed. And I want you to begin to see your own life also. That in one way or the other, you will understand that these six characteristics will be in your life. Now please, as I, as I read the scriptures with you, you ought to be very careful. Before I go on, I want you to look up here. You know, many times we, we compare ourselves with one another. And whenever we read the Bible, uh, many of us are likely to say, I am not like that, I am not like that. Pay attention. You know, you have an orange fruit that, go, that grows on orange trees. And you see the tree that is tangerine. You see another one that is the ordinary orange. You see another one that is um, grapefruit. And if you look at uh, the grapefruit, yellowish in color, very big, and you are just a tangerine, and uh, you might be saying, well, I am not like that, I am not like that. You are what you are by the grace of God. And if God has touched you, that fruit may not look as big as uh, the, uh, the grapefruit, but there is an evidence of grace in your life. Now you may not be immediately, you know, preaching uh, like Paul the Apostle did. You understand this, that he was a student of the Old Testament before he was ever born again. Before he was ever born again, he had had contact with all the, all the heads of, uh, you know, in his own nation. He was a Roman by citizenship. He was a Jew and he was a Pharisee by religion. And he knew the Old Testament scriptures from Genesis right on to Malachi. The only thing is that he did not have the Holy Ghost to interpret it to him, but he knew it all along. He knew the prophecies of uh, Daniel, the prophecies in Hosea, the prophecies in Joel, the prophecies in Malachi. And he knew all that, all that Moses had written. It was only that he did not know that Jesus Christ that died on the cross of Calvary was the person that came to fulfill all those prophecies. And he met the Lord on the way to Damascus. And bang, immediately. All those scriptures he knew before. He didn't have to, you know, start now reading, uh, finding out what is in Genesis chapter 3. He knew it about the seed of the woman. Immediately he knew, oh yes, that's the seed of the woman. It will, it will take some of us years to know that. Immediately he knew. Bang, immediately he was converted. He knew that, that Jesus is a Passover lamb. He knew immediately. That we don't need the blood of bulls and the blood of animals now anymore. That the Messiah had come, the Christ had come. He knew the fulfillment all in his mind. All those three days, he was remembering the prophecies. The prophecies given to David that his son will reign upon the throne. And he knew that that was the person, the son of David. He had known about all the history of the children of Israel before. And the moment he got converted... He was a chosen vessel and he did not go, need to go to seminary. All he, they would teach him in seminary. They were inside the earth. And the Holy Ghost would just take all those ideas and all those things they had learned. And he went on using him from, from that very time. 
uh, you know, we may have uh, the same conversion, but then it may look like we're not like the Apostle Paul. But you understand that all that I'm going to say about the Apostle Paul, everything is in the life of everyone that is born again in varying measures. You have your measure, he had his own measure. And uh, you don't just want to say, well, because mine is not like his own, then I don't have the real thing. Listen to me. When you were born, naturally, you had two hands. Those two hands could not carry a block, but the two hands were there. You had brain. That brain could not read, but the brain was there. You had two legs. Those legs could not run, but the legs were there. That's the point when you are born again. All these things are in your life. Now, it may take some weeks and some months and even some years to develop to excellence. But then they are there. So don't just look at Paul the Apostle and say, well, man is not like that. Take courage. Take heart. What the Lord has started, he will not leave you until he finishes it all. He has started something in your life. That's why you are here tonight. And what he has started, he is going to complete it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let us look at these characteristics. They were, they were pronounced in the life of, of uh, Paul the Apostle. And uh, in varying degrees and varying measures, they are in the lives of all people who have met the Lord, who have had a personal encounter with the Lord, who are born again. Number one, fervor in supplication. You know from verse 9, and he was there three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, here am I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the street which is called Strange, and inquire in the house of Judas for one that is called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayed. What is the first thing a child does when the child is born? The child cries. What's the meaning of that cry? The child is telling the mother, telling whoever is uh, to care for, him, for her, I am here, I have a need. What's the first thing a person will do when he's born again? He will cry, Abba, Father. The heart is opened up. He who did not know how to pray before, he who thought God was far, far away, a million miles in heaven, he becomes born again. What is the thing that happens? He knows that God is near. He may not pray a long prayer, but he prays a heartfelt prayer. And he says, my father, I know you are there. The joy of the Lord is just flowing in my heart. I thank you for saving me. And I want to help other people to know about this salvation. There is that fervor in supplication. Because the natural thing for a child to do when the child is born is to cry. To cry to make, the, to make her need known. And the natural thing, the natural thing for a child of God to do, the moment you are born again, is your heart to be panting after God, reaching out after God, and saying, oh God, I want more of you. I need more of you. You'll be talking to the Lord. And you know, it is not just a matter of kneeling down all the time. It is not a matter of praying all through the night. It is just that calmness, that serenity, that peace of God. And that togetherness with God. You are not running away from God anymore. You are not afraid of God anymore. You are saying, God, show me more of your face. Where are you? I love you. And you are expressing in your own childish way. When you are born again, you are expressing your love to God. There is fervor in supplication. And any little need you have when you are born again, you take it to the Lord in prayer. That is what happens when you are born again. And it happened to Saul of Tarsus. His life had been changed. He had been converted. And now he could pray. You know, before, he wasn't like that. He was a man of intellect. A man that would just uh, use his brain. He leaned much upon his understanding. But you know, now he came to the Lord. And all the time he was having conversation with heaven. He was praying. Fervor in supplication. But now, let me talk to you about this um, Ananias. Ananias was called a certain disciple in Damascus. And we're told that the Lord spoke to him and they said, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. How did he know it was the Lord calling him? Most of you, most of us will not even know that's the voice of the Lord. How do you know somebody's voice? 
when somebody says uh, James oh yes Michael when did you come how do you know it's Michael because that's not the first time you are hearing his name you have heard his name you have heard his voice before and you are familiar with him and because of that familiarity you, know, you say that's the voice of so and so and because Ananias had been listening to the Lord before my brother my sister that doesn't come by just one day relationship with God one day relationship with God how does it come getting intimate with the Lord to the point you know his voice and he said here am I Lord he knew it was the Lord talking and he was not an apostle he was not an evangelist he was not a pastor a certain disciple and you know every one of us as, as children of God as disciples of the Lord we can so get intimate with the Lord and will know when the Lord is talking to us and the Lord said arise and go into the street which is called a street get into the house of Judas ask for one that is called Saul of Tarsus for behold he prayed. Now the Lord uh, gave him here a word of a word of knowledge, because uh, you know he couldn't have known this uh, detail without the gift of the Spirit in his life. And this was a word of knowledge, talking about Saul, even talking about what Saul was doing, praying. Can God give the gifts of the Spirit to a just to just a disciple, somebody who is not an apostle, somebody who is not an evangelist, somebody who is not a missionary? Oh yes, he gave it to Ananias, a certain disciple. And then Ananias said, Oh Lord, I've heard about this man. And I've heard that uh, he's coming here to just bind the saints. Verse 13, then Ananias answered the Lord, I have heard many of this man, how much evil he has done to thy saints at Jerusalem. You know what I learned there? When the Lord is talking to you, he wants you to be relaxed. And when you have any question, he wants you to ask him. And Ananias asked the Lord a question and said, Oh Lord, I know that's your voice, I know you are talking to me, but I've heard about that man. That he was an injurious man, a blasphemer, a terrible man, wicked man, evil man. And I've heard what he has done to many of thy saints at Jerusalem. You don't ever think that whenever God is talking to you, if you ask him a question about it, that God is going to kill you. Or God is going to stop talking to you. Uh, God is a father and he talks to his own children like father. And whenever we have any question and we ask him, he answers us. And then in verse 14, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. O oh Lord, if I go there, will he not kill me? Was he afraid of his life? Oh yes. Didn't God uh, reject him and throw him away from the kingdom because he was afraid for his life? Oh no, sir. Our God is Father. When the mother washes the newborn babe in the morning, does not throw away the newborn babe or the dirty water just because the child is crying. God is a reasonable father. And God doesn't, uh, you know, uh, just throw somebody away because you're asking questions and you're saying, Oh Lord, if I do that, how about my life? But you know, the Lord answered him. The Lord said unto him, Go thy way. I know what I'm telling you. Go thy way. Ananias, don't think about what you are thinking. For he is a chosen vessel. A chosen vessel unto me. Uh, you know, it's so wonderful. And sometimes you have a father. And uh, you are close to the father. Not that you are too old. Not that you have gone out to university, you are a graduate. But just because you are close to your father, you come back. Uh, he comes back from uh, work. And you come back from school. Maybe even primary school. And uh, you sit down. And your father sits down. And you say, Daddy, what are you thinking? Are you about to buy a new car? And Daddy says, uh, yes. In fact, um, next week a new car will be coming to the house now daddy what do you think uh, what's this that is big in the in the tummy of in the belly of a uh, mommy well that's your junior brother junior sister coming you know that freedom between a father and the child uh, you know god was just uh, having a nice time with ananias not an apostle not an evangelist you know you can have a close relationship with the lord even though you are not a pastor you are not an apostle you are not an evangelist you may be one uh, ready to you know become an apostle later but at this time you are still a, a certain disciple like ananias and you know the lord will be talking to you his own secret revealing a secret to you 
and he said he, will, he is a chosen vessel. Not that he will be a chosen vessel. He is a chosen vessel already. Was he born again? He was already born again. To bear my name before the Gentiles, before the kings, before the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. You know, he had um, this wonderful thing. This relationship. Now, what other thing do we find in the life of Saul? We'll see fervor in supplication, faithfulness in service. Faithfulness in service. My brother, my sister, that is in every child of God. Every child of God. Every child of God. Now, as we look at your life and we talk about service, many people do not understand what a service means. They say, well, I'm not serving the Lord because I'm not in the choir. I'm not an usher. I'm not a zona leader. I'm not an house fellowship leader. I'm not serving the Lord because I'm not a great preacher. If you are a child of God, you are serving the Lord. You know, from the time you were born again, the joy of the Lord in your heart that you let out, the testimony that you tell other people, your devotion to the Lord that other people behold and they tremble in fear for the majesty and the glory of God and the sharing of tracts that you do and the way you are faithful in whatever the Lord wanted you to do maybe in even giving your tithes and your offering to the Lord you just became sensitive to serving the Lord and serving the people around you that is faithfulness and service you know it starts in a small way and that thing is not small in the eyes, in the sight of the Lord. You may only be contributing two mites spiritually to the growth of the church. Just your testimony, the two mites. Just encouraging somebody to come along with you in the, to the church. Just your two mites. Or just telling if, uh, somebody who was um, a dancer before, who was a drunkard before with you. And just telling the person, do you know, I went to a church, I went to deeper life. And I've given my life to the Lord. The joy of the Lord is now my strength. And uh, I want you to follow me. Our church uh, is just so wonderful. And I enjoy that church more than I enjoyed all the churches I was going before. You know you're already serving the Lord. And you're seeking out your friend. And you're telling them about uh, the goodness of the Lord. You know you're already serving the Lord. And he did. Saul of Tarsus. Immediately. He was faithful. There is faithfulness in service in everyone that has been born again. Look at, um, already we have read how the Lord said, He is a chosen vessel. And he did carry it out. Verse 20. Straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. You say, but I cannot do that. I've explained to you already. You know, when you become a Christian, all that you had known before god begins to use everything right at that point this man had known hebrew before he started using it he knew greek before this time he started using it he was a trained mind a sharp person like a lawyer and he was a deep in logic he was a scientific in approach and he was powerful in communication and he started using all those things immediately and you know all, the, all that he had used for the cause of the devil, all that he had used, he now just turned everything over to the Lord and he, he just started using everything. Now listen to me. If before you were born again, all you, had, all you had was a bicycle, you'll be using the bicycle for the Lord. If before you were born again, you had a Volvo, you'll be using the Volvo for the Lord. But then before you were born again, you had an aeroplane. You'll be carrying tracks of the aeroplane. And yet, you know, even though you have a bicycle, you may not be able to do as much as the person that had aeroplane before, but both of you are faithful in service. And that's the, that's the case with Saul of Tarsus. He had much more than, you know, everybody else. Even naturally, natural talent, natural gift, natural ability. And he just began to use everything. He was faithful in service. In our own case, you don't know Greek. You don't know Hebrew. You don't know the whole of the Old Testament. You didn't know that before you were born again. All that you know is just what you give to the Lord. And the Lord is happy. 
if you just come to the Lord with everything you have and say, Lord, here am I. I just want to be able to invite people to church. I want to be able to tell them of my, of my own salvation, my testimony. I just want to be able to tell them of what you have done in my life. Oh, my brother, my sister, that's enough. And that is wonderful. Faithfulness in service. And uh, he was very faithful. Number three, the feeling of the Spirit. In verse 17, And Ananias went his way, and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, Brother Saul, Brother Saul, Brother Saul. Why am I repeating that? Listen to me. Saul did not know what was going to happen on the way to Damascus. Do you know what? He dressed like a Pharisee. While he was, because he was a Pharisee. Anywhere he went, he looked at him like this. He had a dressing on. He dressed like he would normally dress. And on the way to Damascus, his heart changed. His dress had not changed. Because, you know, he had not gone back home. This was just this man coming from Jerusalem. And right on the way, the Lord met him and changed him and transformed him. And he became a child of God. And he did not, he couldn't even see. His eyes were still blind. And his dress was still on him. And he went into the house and he was praying. And when Ananias came, Ananias saw a man that dressed like a Pharisee. Saw a man that dressed like a member of the Sanhedrin. And yet he said, brother Saul. Not on the basis of the dressing, on the basis of what the Lord told Ananias. Already I have caught him. My hand is upon him. Whatever you see on the outside, the inside is different. My brother, somebody comes to church just like he would come or she would come with alcohol smelling in the mouth because he just drank that before he came to church with cigarette tobacco smelling in the mouth because he had been a terrible smoker and he came to the Lord you know like we're here tonight and we give an altar call and he becomes born again the smell in his mouth is still there and uh, you know uh, the appearance uh, is still there if the air is uh, maybe like the air of one of the gang outside it is still like that but you know the joy of the Lord is in his heart now. His life is changed. And you just turn around and you see him and he says, Praise the Lord with me. I gave my life to the Lord. I'm now a child of God. While he's saying that, you are, you are smelling tobacco and alcohol. <laughs> you say, hmm, you are a child of God. My brother, it's not the outside, it's the inside. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If you will give that man chance, if you'll be patient with that man, the next time you see him, tobacco will not be smelling in his mouth, alcohol will not be smelling in his mouth, and Ananias entered. And even though he saw a man that was dressed as, uh, as a Pharisee, having authority, having letters, the letters were still in his box because he had been blind. He didn't even think about all those things now. But, brother Saul, my brother, my sister, the ways of God are wonderful. And then he told him, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared to thee in the way, as thou camest, he sent me, he has sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight. Can somebody who is not an apostle pray for another person? You can. If somebody is sick in, my, in our house and I'm not, a, I'm not the pastor, I'm not the evangelist, I'm not a, a deacon, I'm not a worker in the church. Can I pray for another person? You can. The Lord has sent me to you that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And it was filled with the Holy Ghost. Our Lord is wonderful. Now, listen to me. When you have somebody who has been an enemy before, your enemy before, and now that person met you, and just uh, within three days, let me ask you a question. Will you just uh, go back to your house and look at the best of what you have? This person has been a terrible enemy. He had even killed uh, maybe some of your relatives before. And uh, it has also touched you. But eventually he came around and you, you settled the whole quarrel. But within three days now, 
after three days, will you go and look into your house and find the best gift you can ever give and give it to that individual? Most people will not. You know, Saul had been a great enemy of God, a great enemy of Jesus Christ, a terrible persecutor. And um, he gave his life to the Lord. And this was just the third day. And Ananias said, the Lord has sent me to you to give you the best you can ever have. The third person in the Trinity, the Holy Ghost, that you will be filled, you will be saturated, you will be overflowing with the Holy Ghost after three days of settling the account with the Lord. I'm saying that the Lord is a gracious God. The Lord is a wonderful God. You know, it doesn't matter what you have done before. The moment you settle with God, the moment you say, Lord, here am I. I am now in your hand. You can have the best of gifts coming from heaven. And then we're told in verse 18, immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. And he received sight forthwith. And he arose and he was baptized. That means he was baptized in water. What is that? Fellowship with the saints. What is water baptism? Water baptism is a public declaration that I am no more of the world. I now belong to this group of people. I'm now identified with Christ and identified with his people. And he was baptized in water. And we're told in verse 19, when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the, with the disciples which were at Damascus. Have you ever seen a lion? I just broke out in the street wanting to pounce upon uh, the sheep on the street something happened that that lion after jumping up he just came down and he was lying down and now the lion and the lambs they are all feeding together and people say what a wonder is this is this a dream it's a dream coming from above. This lion, wild, terrible, deadly, bloody, wanting to kill. He was coming with fury from Jerusalem, like a lion wanting to pounce upon all the sheep in Damascus. He came to Damascus. What do we find? We find the lion and the lamb sitting together, discussing together. No more harm, no more injury. He now started having fellowship with the saints. It's an evidence of conversion. This man was really converted. You know, when you are born again, when you are converted, there will be that desire inside your heart to want to fellowship with the saints. Now in verse um, 20. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that is the Son of God. But all that were, all that heard him were amazed. And they said, It's not this seed that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem. And it came either that for the intent, for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which, be, which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. He had fervency in speaking. And he was never tired. Like when he was in the world and was fighting a losing battle for the devil on the side of the enemy of the gospel, he was never tired. In fact, you know, he was a tent maker by profession. But many days he would just leave his tent making and be going from house to house, house to house. He was fervent in serving the devil. Now he had become born again. What do you find? You find fervency in speaking. He would just speak for the Lord. And he was never tired about it at all. Until people were wondering, is this not the person that came to persecute people? Came to bind people that dwell at uh, Damascus mentioning this name. And now he's proving that this is the very Christ. And of course suffering came. But you find this man also having fearlessness and suffering. In verse 23, after that many, day, after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But they are laying, they are laying away. It was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night. The disciples, 
the disciples took him by night. You know, they were now caring for him as their fellow brother. They didn't say, that's good for him. If they are waiting to kill him. And now, even though he has been born again, other people suffer too. When he was an unbeliever, it's all right for him. Let them kill him. God, it's true you have forgiven him, but teach him a lesson. You know, some Christians, we, we have not forgiven the people God has forgiven. God has forgiven him, but then we say, well, he was bad, he was evil. Will he just find it easy like that and just come into the fellowship and be high about it? All that he did, all he did before, he must pay for it. Oh no. Those disciples did not have that mind at all. And even though he was fearless in suffering, and you know later, um, as you read the Acts of the Apostles and as you read the Epistles as well, he said, none of these things move me. Fearless, fearless. But then the disciples were caring. They took him by night and they let him down by the basket, uh, by the wall in the basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, what was the first thing he, he wanted to do? He attempted, he had said, he tried to join himself to the disciples. But they were afraid, they were all afraid of him. And believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas, the son of encouragement, the son of consolation, took him and brought him to the apostles. And apparently Barnabas had a, a weighty testimony among the apostles. And he knew that if he said anything, it was the truth. And he declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way. And that he had spoken to him. And how that he had put boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. You know, all that was in his life. Favor in supplication, in prayer. Faithfulness in service. Feeling of the spirit. Fellowship with the saints. Everything continued right to the last point. And fervency in speaking. Everything continued right to the last point. And you know in this verse 28 he still added. Fellowship with the saints. And we're told in verse 29. He spake boldly. That means that the fervency in speaking still continued as well. In the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. But they went about to slay him. Which when the brethren knew. They brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Then at the churches rest throughout all Judea. The persecutor has been converted. The churches are dressed throughout all Judea. The one that is going about causing unrest for all the churches in Judea and Galilee. Every, the churches had rest. They now were able to fellowship. The gang leader of the persecutors have joined the rank and file of the believers. And now they are dressed throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria. And they were edified. Walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, they were multiplied. I want you to look at those two words in verse 31. They were edified, then they were multiplied. What's the secret of church growth? Number one, let the church be edified. And then number two will follow, the church will be multiplied. Let there be a spiritual a strength and spiritual a fervency and let there be edification within the church. Let there be love in the church and the church is edified. What will follow? Numerical growth will follow. The church will multiply. We thank God for what we have learned in the life of Saul of Tarsus. But you must remember he said, I am what I am by the grace of God. And that grace that was abundantly available to him is abundantly available to every one of us. All these qualities we too can have in our lives. If we're born again, we have them already in a measure. And we can go to the Lord in prayer and say, Oh Lord, we want more of these qualities in our lives. And the Lord will give unto us. Rise up and let us pray. Let's thank the Lord for his goodness. The way he did it for Paul. And is willing to lavish his grace upon you.